We have our special guest here, Melina Simple Watts. Uh, she grew up in LA since she was seven. She um, got a history degree from UCLA. She's a uh, professional writer who started as a in Hollywood uh, as an executive and a consultant. And she has um, worked uh, for many years in the ecosystem restoration in the watershed context. And she has come. 500 miles from Chico today to uh, give us this reading and sharing of her new project, uh, Tree. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. And I will throw in that that was with two small children in the car. <laughs> Where are the children? The children are visiting with their dad and their nine year old grandmother, who has been blind since the age of five. And she raised three sighted children, so if you want to talk respect, wow. I have, and her house is spotless. I, I'm like totally intimidated. <laughs> She's a lovely person, so they're off in Burbank today. So that's, that's that. So I will share with you that I, uh, I was a history major at UCLA, and because I studied Japanese history and Indian history, there's a whole lot of Buddhism that weaves into each of those, those two studies. So I have a lot of familiarity with, with Buddhism, but I am, in fact, not a practicing Buddhist, and I'm very humbled and honored to be here. And I feel like my basic premise is a bit audacious, which is I would like to share with you my thoughts on how a tree, a the tree under which Buddha meditated, influenced the Buddha to become the Buddha instead of a prince who became, you know, the enlightened one, right? And so that may sound presumptuous as heck to those of you who have spent a lifetime meditating and studying Buddhism. So. I'm going to start with my most difficult personal story because I think it explains why I wrote the book and also why I feel comfortable sharing what I feel uh, the Buddhist experience may have been while under a tree. So uh, when I went uh, to Marlboro with my friend Jill in the front row here, uh, I was at an all-girls school in this area. I had brilliant, loving, charming friends. I was really happy, right? And then when I was a freshman in college, I went to UC San Diego where I knew no one. And everybody I knew scattered to the East Coast and abroad and elsewhere. And I don't know about your experience of college, but I experienced it as crushingly lonely and isolating. It was awful, is the word that comes to mind, right? And so here I am in the prime of my life, right? It's a Friday night, and I'm going back to, I went to UC San Diego before I transferred to Sealand. I'm going back to my dorm, and it feels like every single person with whom I'm acquainted is out at a party or on a date or doing something fun, and I have nowhere to go, no one to speak to. And the sense that my life has no meaning, like that I can't figure out what to do next, like just kind of grief and depression and frankly maybe even feeling suicidal, right? Like it was bad. So I come back to my dorm and I can't go inside, it's a Friday night, right? So I just see in front of the four dorms is this big quad, a very ordinary suburban style lawn. It's grass, right? I lay down on the grass feeling really sad and the sun is set and the stars are starting to come out. And as I'm laying there, I feel one of the grass feel me. And it feels like it's not actually can't see light, but it felt like a pop of light coming at me in my chest, like it was saying hello, right? And I was so touched. So I said, kind of hello back, right? And then it felt like this little grass said to the grass next to it, ah, oh, this animal, this person, she's really bad. She's lonely. <laughs> Say hello. And so the next two grasses kind of popped little dots of light at me. And I kind of said, hello back, you know? And then the next ones spoke to the next ones. And I'm telling you that from that one individual grass, it went like this throughout the entire field of grass till this entire huge field of grass was emoting at me, for lack of a better word. And I was emoting back. And it was the most exuberantly joyful, connecting, loving experience of my whole life. It was absolutely amazing. So this field of grass is why I wrote this book tree, because it's, this, this book is for that field of grass that lifted me up and, and cared for me. So I want to answer the question today, why, uh, to what extent did the tree influence uh, the Buddha's enlightenment? So I'm going to start with a story that I'm sure everyone in this room knows in much more depth than me, but I want to share kind of my perceptions of the same familiar story, because we all experienced the same story in different ways, right? So as you know, uh, the Buddha was raised by the world's, world's most 
uh, extremely helicopter parents of all time, <laughs> right? He, he had a, a, a king and a queen who saw their perfect baby boy and they thought no harm is ever going to come to this baby. And if any of you love a child in this world, tell me you haven't had that moment of like, oh, anything for you, right? So unfortunately, they carried that out through the kid's entire adolescence. And so when he should have been out like, you know, doing whatever exuberant thing that young men or young women want to do, he was protected in this beautiful castle with these beautiful gardens. And they gave him every precious, beautiful thing. And they married him to a beautiful princess. And he got married. And he had another beautiful little baby. And they thought they had done everything just right, right? And again, I'm, I'm looking in the mirror here. <laughs> I think the overprotective thing is very current, right? So then there came that fateful day that the beautiful prince said, I've heard there's beautiful things in the forest beyond the palace gates. I'm going to go for a walk. And he just boldly walked out of the palace gates. He was a man. He was going to do what men do, right? And he ran into four terrible things very shortly, one after the other. He saw the first poor person he'd ever seen. He saw the first really ill person he'd ever seen. He saw someone getting old for the first time. And Lord save him, he saw a dead person for the first time. Now, if you can imagine never having been exposed to these things since infancy on, as most of the rest of us are, the crushing angst and grief that I experienced that day in the grass magnified times exponentially, right? Like, just awful. I think he had, like, kind of a nervous breakdown, was what, what, what we would call it now. And when I was a girl and I was first exposed to Buddhism, I thought, wow, he left his wife and baby. I don't want to hear about that. Like, I completely could not embrace his teachings because of identifying with the lost princess, the left behind wife, right? And that poor baby who had no dad. Now that I've raised three children and I'm a single mom, all of my compassion is for how sad he must have felt. Because I see many, many men nowadays leaving their wives and children and not coming back and not being there for their children. And what I experience with those men and that core abandonment that they're doing is that they're abandoning themselves far more than they're abandoning their children. And the reason they leave their women and children is because they are so disconnected from loving other people and loving themselves that they feel that the child is actually better off without them, that the woman can raise the baby better than they can and that they just give up, that they don't have what it takes to be the patriarch and the father and the loving daddy and, and, and all those things that we they feel. So now, again, as, as someone who's older, I look at the Buddha and I'm like, I completely understand what was I think he was feeling on those days. And the part of the story that's rarely told, and this is why I dragged us through the story that I know you all know, <laughs> is when he went back to tell everyone I'm leaving, I believe that he had a knockdown drag out fight with his parents, which I might have experienced once or twice with my 22 year old that was so painful, and he said to his parents, you have failed me, you lied to me, you didn't tell me what the world was really like, and all of those things were true, so what could they say back? So he had a breakup with his parents, and then with his wife, I can't presume to say what kind of conversation he had, but I can tell you, I imagine the emotional reality of someone who's been at the receiving end of that kind of a departure, that it was unbelievably painful on both sides, and then Whatever it was he said to that baby as he kissed it and he walked out of the forest. It was also so painful. So what he left with, besides those four things that we know that he was experiencing, I believe, equal magnitude, was a broken heart to end all time. Like, just crushed, right? So he goes out into the forest and he's looking for enlightenment. And at that time in India, there were amazing gurus in the forest who were brilliant, more brilliant than any psychologist we can imagine or, or, or just... And then they were all kind of working in different directions. And he connected with different teachers. And he put everything he had into it. And he tried being ascetic and stopping eating and you know, all these harsh practices, trying to find enlightenment. And nothing was working for him. And I'm going to double back to, I believe that he had such a severely broken heart from that departure that these teachers couldn't reach him. No one could reach him because he was so sad. right? So he goes out into the forest. And he finds the famous Bodhi tree. And he looks at the Bodhi tree and he says, I'm going to sit under this tree and I am not getting up again until I figure it out. And he sat there and he meditated for however many days and nights. And as he meditated, all the pieces of what we know of as Buddhism and wisdom and compassion and enlightenment came up in him. And I believe that the tree itself was communicating to him tree values and plant values. And much of what we love and cherish in Buddhism actually stems from 
the connection that the Buddha developed with the tree as he was sitting in solitude, because he wasn't really alone. He was in the forest. So um, I would like to share with you some of the things that I have learned from trees that I think may resonate with you as Buddhists. And so the first set of things I'm going to share with are what I would call the physically obvious things about trees that give us wisdom and insight. And the second things are things that I believe plants are capable of communicating to people and are capable of receiving, but that modern science is just sort of gearing up to, but I believe the Buddha was already there, right? So um, when it comes to things that uh, the Buddha received from trees, the first and foremost, of course, would be silence. Nothing does silence as well as a tree or a forest, <laughs> right? So if you're sitting there, and I was, I was telling some of you that I was blessed to meet before this event started, if there's anyone in this room who has issues with monkey mind and just ask my sister, it will be me. Um, so any, any chance I have of serenity or wisdom, I got from trees and forests. And I believe that the Buddha, sitting under that tree, received first that gift of silence, that trees, to like, trees can help you be silent better than any living being. The next thing that they received, you, the, the Buddha received from uh, being under a tree, was how to be still. And again, as someone who's really like, I did dance, I did martial arts, I horseback ride, so someone who's really kind of too active, I just drove 500 miles to get here. Being still is something that you get from trees and from forests. And then trees are incredibly emotionally receptive and incredibly, um, I don't know how to pronounce this word, aurally, A-U-R-A-L-L-Y, aurally receptive. Right? So I believe that the tree helped the Buddha be, emphasize being a listener because the great teachers are always the best listeners in, in my experience. Um, so one of the things you learn from a tree is trees plant where they're grown. All the rest of us, it's like go, 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 new job, you know, new, new partner, new education, new place, new country, right? But a tree, wherever they start, that is where they will spend their whole life growing and being. So that ability to plant where you're grown is a profound life gift that you can learn from trees that I think was part of what informed the, the Buddha's thinking and being. So related to that is the experience of being rooted and being willing to connect intimately to the earth and to get wisdom and, and strength from the earth that, that trees have. So part of that being in one place is trees don't exist alone ever. They exist interrelated with the living things in the soil, with the other plants with the insects, <coughs> with the teeny tiny things that maybe the Buddha didn't know the words of but knew they were there, like fungi and bacteria and all those little guys, and, and birds and all of it. So there's a whole ecosystem that surrounds any individual tree, and the tree is a part of receiving that energy coming and going at all times. So the ability to be in Sangha, to be in community, I believe that sitting still, being in the tree, and seeing the world come and go to the tree, that may have helped the Buddha understand the importance of community in a different way than you would get in a kind of a fancy palace in a court setting, right? Um, uh, another thing that trees get um, is uh, no matter how far back you go in history, anybody who has anything to do with, with any kind of farming or eating knows that trees receive light and they turn that into food using water and dirt and light, which is pretty close to magic if you ask me, right? And so that is, to my mind, the ultimate form of right livelihood. Nothing is harmed by how a tree exists, right? It's just receiving and turning it into something <coughs> lovely. And then trees are givers. They give, they let us, you know, they let plants eat their leaves, and they, they give us fruits and nuts, and they grow, and they, they give us shade. So that, that givingness of trees is another thing that I think the Buddha received. Um, so a really important part of being in a forest and watching that ecosystem come and go is experiencing death and life. And uh, there are living beings that are small plants like grass that have a very short lifespan, or trees that are hundreds of years far older than us, practically like vampires, they live forever, it feels like to us with our hundred year lives, right? Um, and then there's all these birds and insects that have short lives and long lives. So I think sitting in a forest day and night and day and night, we start to see that ebb and flow. So our understanding of mortality and evanescence, I think is forest driven. So that acceptance of evanescence comes from, from being a part of this. Um, finally, I think there's, well not finally, there's more. But, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, one of the really compelling things I think about uh, how the Buddha's ideas about uh, mortality comes from trees is trees' experience of death and rebirth is considerably different than ours. Um, seeds can look dead before they grow again. And then there's this wonderful thing called stump sprouting. I don't know if you're familiar with it. 
but you can see a forest burn down in the Santa Monica Mountains or cut down the Santa Monica Mountains, and certain species, the roots are still growing, right? And they're still hanging in there, but they don't have any leaves to photosynthesize, so those roots will not live forever. But they'll take what juice they have left, and they'll sprout up side new versions of themselves, and then they'll have new trees. So you'll sometimes see a very tightly knit grove of sycamore trees all growing out like this from a tiny circle. They all came from that center plant. So is that the original plant? Are those baby plants? Or are they a different version of the same plant? I don't know. But it feels a lot like reincarnation to me, right? That's, that's my feeling, at least. Um, there are also grasses that do a similar thing. Um, then finally, when you look at, i got to stop using that word finally, it's misleading. Um, I'm sorry. Um, when, um, when you look at uh, how a plant like, uh, is, uh, loses a branch or a plant will actually die, and the process of it getting broken down and returned into soil by other living beings tearing it apart or eating it or digesting it, and then it actually becomes you know, something for its raw materials for a tree to grow again, to my mind, that cycle that's visible if you're sitting there in the forest watching it, because the process of it going from fall down leaves to duff to compost can happen relatively quickly. That is also the closest thing to actual reincarnation in nature that you can see, right? So I think that that might have inspired some of the thinking along those lines. So acceptance of, then there's, um, there's two things that happen when you're in a large forest ecosystem that are drought, where things appear to die off, or in fact do die off, and then kind of resurge, or they're going <coughs> resurge, or forest fires, where it totally destroys everything, but then it comes back, it comes back to life. I think that that's, those cycles are really a way of learning about evanescence, and that all things change, but that life comes back and resurges, that I feel imb is embedded in Buddhism. So those are the things I think that are the basics, but the other thing that I could stand to learn, that I think the Buddha learned from trees, is trees communicate and experience life on a very slow pace. So the patience of trees and the willingness to let life go on at the pace it wants to and not to be like, go, 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 I've got to get you know that next job interview or else and I've got to make it all happen, it's the opposite of that. So that, that, that is a lesson from trees. <coughs> so the other half of the talk, which is much shorter, is um, uh, exploring how trees actually do communicate. And we live in a really exciting time right now. Because when I was a girl and I said, maybe to my friends in elementary school, that I thought the plants were talking to me, they all looked at me like I seriously needed some intervention, right? But nowadays, there's a lot of scientists exploring plant-plant communication. So there's three main forms that they've discovered that they think plants actually communicate. The first of these is scent. So if any of you have ever used like sage in a blessing ceremony, we're using plant communication to talk to each other. And plants are known to use uh, plant hormones to project that they are getting eaten by a, for example, this is a study in Africa, a, a plant that's getting eaten by a giraffe will give off plant pheromones of distress, and plants down the way will go, oh, there's giraffes in the neighborhood, and start putting bitter toxins into their leaves, so they don't taste as good to the other giraffes. So they're telling each other, I'm going down, but look out, buddy, you know, they're, they're helping each other, right? So scientists are able to track that. I would say what scientists haven't caught to up to, but I think it's really important, is I believe the plants are communicating their joy to each other with scent. And that's why we're attracted to all these plant smells for perfumes, right? We know that plants give off pretty flower smells to attract you know, bees to get pollinated. But I also think they're just talking to each other, saying, oh, I'm here, I'm full of joy, smell me, right? So um, I think that um, uh, that might be arguable, that, uh, that those emotions coming and going from the, the plants could be the protection of the sangha, right? Or even the celebrations that we have here are, are related to scent and that emotion coming from plants by smell. Another way that we know that plants are communicating, and this is so delightful, this woman, Dr. Suzanne Schumtard from um, Canada, discovered this. And now there's people, there's young PhD students in, you know, um, Australia and in Europe and other places, uh, England and other places, duplicating her research. So she was right, right? Because that's how science works. You come up with a good theory and then other people duplicate it. So she discovered that science, uh, trees were using fungal networks underground with their roots to send messages through the fungal networks back and forth to each other. And the estimated time from this tree talking to this tree with a fungal network, three weeks maybe, like days, six weeks, like very slow. So if you've ever seen the Japanese style of dance called buto, that's fast. 
Okay, right? So, um, <laughs> um, so this, it, this fungal network stuff is great, and one of the things that they're able to do with the fungal network that's kind of mind-blowing is they're able, as I understand it, to give food and to give water to a tree that's in trouble, whether it's a younger tree that they're helping come up, or it's an older tree. So uh, there's this guy, uh, Peter Wollewein, he's a fabulous writer, from, uh, he's uh, uh, um, from Germany, right? And he started off as a forester. And of course, foresters are like ranchers. Their job is to kill the trees and harvest them, right? But he started letting people come and research at his forest scientists, and he basically fell in love with his trees, and he went back to the little village where he lived that had hired him to be their forester and said, I can make more money for you than cutting down the trees, making it a place for people to come and study, for people to come and hike, and for people to come and get buried. And they said, great. So nobody's cutting down his trees anymore. So one of the things he discovered in the, the, the scientists that he brought in were tracking was that there were certain um, cut down trees that gave off all the evidence of still being alive that were like 100 years old. And so what they discovered is that the trees were using these fungal networks to continue to feed the cut down trees. And they couldn't do it for all the trees. So basically these trees they are suggesting were like their senseis that they still loved. And they're like, oh, we'll keep you going even though you're cut down, right? So the other thing they're talking about the trees can do is I don't know if you guys ever did family hold back when guests came to your house and you'd have a huge tray of food and your parents would say, oh, we've got guests, let them eat, this. Let them eat the good stuff first. If there's leftovers, you can have some, <laughs> right? Well, the trees are deliberately holding back from growing over certain baby trees that they're trying to help grow so that mm -hmm. the baby trees can get sunlight, mm -hmm. right? And the baby trees can get rain. Mm -hmm. So there's all of this stuff going on that you don't necessarily see at first glance unless you're, you know, Siddhartha and you see it all. Um, <laughs> So the last thing that, uh, which to me is the most interesting uh, about trees communicating, is there was this fabulous guy in India, and he was born like, I'm going to get the year wrong, and I know I make film, but I think it's like 1880 that he was born, right? So by the 20s, he was a physicist and a polymath who was doing, you know, biology, physics, all this stuff, and his name was Sir Shangradath Bose. So if you have Bose electronics in your car, it was named after him. And one of the things he experimented with was putting plants together and seeing if they could communicate electrically or if he could communicate with it electrically. And it seemed pretty clear to him that this was the case. So he reported what he was experiencing and people in England and in Europe were scathing and said, oh, those Hindus are all so um, mystical. They, it's, he's mistaken. Well, what's really exciting about it is starting in the 90s, research similar to his is being implemented and guess what? He was right. He was a hundred years ahead of his time. Hundred years ahead of his time. And so it turns out the plants, the plants are communicating electrically. And so what this means to me is, I don't know if you've ever done this exercise where you rub your hands really fast and then you hold them like this. Can you feel, you could feel, if you hold them like an inch or two away from each other, you could feel energy back and forth between your hands. And you could actually make it like a ball that you pass closer or expand, right? And, and you know, is it friction, is it heat, is it electricity? I don't know. But when you go like this, and you walk through the forest with your eyes closed, if you just sit and you go like this, you may start to feel energy from the plants and trees. So the last thing that I want to say about tree communication is there are some theorizing that they have little stomata in their leaves that they receive light from that they may in fact be using to see. So if trees can see, the process by which they see, if you close your eyes and you talk about that third eye when you're meditating, and you maybe see light coming and going through that, or through here, that may be the kind of seeing that they're doing. So if you sit in the forest and you, you just are receptive to energy and you put out your own life force through your hands, you may feel a give and take from the trees. And I believe that that calmness and serenity and sense of being part of all living beings that the forest gives us is what stems the incredibly all-encompassing love of, of Buddhist teachings. Because so much of, uh, the wonderfulness of the Judaic Christian Islamic tradition is me, us, men, people, and God, us, right? And so much of what Hinduism and Buddhism bring to the table is we are all living beings. And this is associated with many tribal cultures, um, including the Shumash that I have some ties to because of writing this book, right? Where they believe that all beings are living beings. So when I was working with the Shumash scholar to make sure that the Shumash parts of my book were were good, and it came back with a lot of red, super humbling. Um, I was talking to her about 
being worried about being mocked in the environmental community for talking about plants talking to me because, of course, we're all science and data-based, right? And she said, why would you feel worried about that? We all talk to plants. So what I'm experiencing <laughs> is certain communities, like uh, particularly native communities and Spanish speakers, have said to me, oh yeah, my mom talks to plants, I talk to plants. Turns out a lot of people are talking to plants. So I'm just going to say I think that the Buddha was uh, talking to plants and receiving some wisdom that uh, was able to be re-articulated into teachings that are more sophisticated than I'm capable of articulating. You know, the, the Four Noble Truths and the, eight, the Eightfold Path, all of these things. I think you can think about what plants teach us and you could arguably link up each of those teachings to what plants teach us because I think uh, Buddha's wisdom expanded from a human perspective to an all-living being perspective thanks, thanks to the, the tree. So I would like to, with your permission, read four little pieces from my book and open up to questions. Does that sound like what you would? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first piece will be about uh, birth, and the next two pieces will be about food and eating, because I'm sorry, I'm a foodie, i got to go there. And the last piece will be about uh, mortality, but uh, hopefully not too soon. So. Um. Okay. The tree was enormous, with roots that reached down into the stillness of the mountain. Centuries of rain and drought, of fire and regeneration, had brought an, imp an impervious calmness that drew plants, creatures, rain, and stone towards it, each hoping to acquire peace from proximity. However, neutrality is not the same as peace, and this tree's disdain for emotion was so great that the comfort it brought others was tinged with sadness, for this tree's secret message was that there is no happiness. Only serenity loss. <laughs> so this is a piece about eating. <clears throat> 